In 1999, the United States was quietly being taken over by Great Britain. A vigilant patriot named Russell J. Gould recognized the threat, and in a series of strategic moves, he saved us from foreign invasion. He took control of the Title IV U.S. flag and logged it in with the United Nations, becoming sovereign successor to Great Britain. When the political dust settled, Mr. Gould had taken over several high-ranking government positions, and that put the country's true terrorists on notice. He introduced a language called Now Time Quantum Grammar. Then he used it to prove all previous legal and financial documents to be fraudulent. This saved the U.S. trillions of dollars in debt. He redesigned the periodic table of elements. His work was referred to as extraterrestrial technology and genius. As a reward for his efforts, he was arrested and tortured by the government that he saved. In 1996, 1997, uh, 1998, um, I was uh, living with my grandmother um, in Arapahoe, Wyoming, on the Wind River Indian Reservation, uh, with the Eastern Shoshone Tribe and the Northern Arapaho Tribe. I was um, geographically literally in between two tribes where we were staying. And I ran into um, some situations where I got in some legal difficulties dealing with traffic citation courts. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. Um, according to Stefan's question about the stamps and the importance of stamps, yeah. uh, my uncle, this was three years ago, we, yeah. just, we were in a state district court, well he was, he was involved in an action where his grandpa, he owns an ex excavating company. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa, who was 84, was in the backhoe driving on the shoulder. And my un uncle was behind him in his dump truck. And a guy come around the corner and come in and hit my grandpa and knocked him into another car. Well, this action started back actually back in I think 90, 90 or 89 or 90. And my uncle, you know, has a little bit of money, so the attorneys see, ah, easy prey. Got him. So they start out in a city court. And my uncle, you know, like a good, good person, goes and hires an attorney. Of course, he gets found not guilty. You know, the trial lasts over about six, seven months. Gets found not guilty. You know, fees go up. Well, the prosecution comes back in and files in a county court, saying, oh, that can't be right, that can't be right. Come on, attorney, let's, let's, let's try this out again. So he sues my uncle again, same charge, because nothing was processed. So the same scenario goes around for about four times. Four times. And then back in, I believe it was 98. God, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Back in 98, uh, I'm like, no, enough is enough. I said, I'm coming down there. Fire that piece of crap. I'm coming to court. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and we file in a charter vessel contract. And we file it, you know, coming in as the witness to safeguard the court. So we get there, and we do this about 48 hours before he has to be into this. And we're in a state district court. Uh, it was 13th uh, District Court, Colorado, Chaffee County, Wyoming, uh, Colorado. Yeah. And I stroll in, in there, and I wheel in my 85-year-old grandpa. By this time, he's already, you know, 85 years old, up at there in age. And I'm feeling pretty sorry for my uncle and my mom. This was the first time she, you know, my mom's very concerned about her boy, of course. <laughs> yeah. And we stroll on into court, and my mom is very nervous. And I'm like, no, no, this is not incorrect. This is not right. Well, we got some procedural questions here. So we address stamps. We address bills of lading, yeah, unprocessed through yeah. the years, through stacks and stacks. So we stroll on into court. I step through the bar, of course, capture the judge right off the chute, Title IV flag. He goes, oh, good looks at the paperwork and we, you know, we're Title IV flag, Unity hyphen States, you know, go through the scenario in the noun with our noun names and uh, start addressing the procedure. And the judge takes a look at all this and he turns all red. He starts turning red because they've all been caught. They want to get my uncle for 32 grand and he's got like 32 grand, another 32 grand on top of uh, unpaid lawyer fees. You know, he's like, he was unsatisfied with his lawyer but he agreed to keep him and that, you know, it was a con job. And so we start addressing procedure. And the judge looks at it and goes, you're right. There is no procedure here. And then I turned around and started attacking the language on how, 
my uncle was immune from everything. Okay, let me show you a little example to show you how simple this is. When we're taught to write a, a letter in fiction, need this? no, we write our letter, dear so and so, da 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 da. <laughs> yeah. We place our, place our authorization on the bottom, taking jurisdiction of the subject matter which we've just created. Is it, would everybody agree with that? But what happens when they move this person up here with the rules of continuance of evidence? He is immune from everything after his name. So what are Jack and Jill responsible for that they taught you in first grade? Absolutely nothing. Jack and nothing. Jill ran up the hill. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You've been duped. You've all been programmed. Very simple once you figure it out. So you must follow the rules of continuance of evidence. So anyways, we start systematically tearing apart this judge. <laughs> Future tense, past tense, all over the map. And he's sitting there and he's going like this. In law. And of course, at this time, you know, the security guards didn't know and the cops, the sheriffs didn't know what was going on. My mom was real nervous. And my uncle's kind of a shy guy, kind of quiet. And I got him just roaring, it, just <laughs> screaming. I'm just <laughs> laughing at my uncle, you know, for having a good time. Yeah. And he's bellering out what I'm telling him to say. And the sheriffs are sitting back like this and they're coming to, they're coming to. And they stand up and they're looking. I'm like, pal, forget it, sit down. <laughs> and, we, and we proceed to systematically tear the language apart. Well, the point being that language meant something. And the judge from the bench goes, you know what? There is no language in my court and there is no procedure. He turned and I go, objection, Your Honor. If there's no language in this court and there is no procedure, then why are we here? Get out of my court! <laughs> Slaps his gavel. You, you get out of my court! Objection, Your Honor. You have 120 days to join with the Title IV flag of the Unity Hyphen States of the America. No! Slaps his gavel. All you attorneys, he says, pay each other. And you, you get out of here. I'm going, objection, Your Honor. You have a, he just took off a running. I'm going. <laughs> Haven't he heard from the guy since. It's, it's so simple. It's just stay on point. Yeah. Just stay on point. There's no reason, no re uh, reason to be scared of anybody. When you know, if you take a very humble and honest approach at what you are doing and know what you are doing, you're going to have a lot of success. And I was studying about grammar uh, with, a, with a gentleman who ended up being a big influence on my life and ended up being my corporate partner until his, his health concerns, and that was David Hyphenwinkle and Miller. And I, my name is Federal Postal Judge full colon David hyphen win full colon Miller. I punctuate my name with a full colon because it creates a prepositional phrase. I use a hyphen to make my David win a compound fact and then I follow that with a full colon to identify my surname which is Miller. So it's for the David win of the Miller family because full colons are prepositional phrases to express a fact and through our studies and through what we had um, found through trial and error, mainly by myself uh, in, the, in, the, in the court systems, we came upon a guise, a ruse that we found to create every citizen on planet Earth and make them a utility and a slave to contract. Uh, what I'm going to give closure on today will be the the mechanics of how they use those contracts to keep mankind, regardless of race, regardless of faith, regardless of status quo in financial and social status, keep them a slave to that contract from cradle to grave. Um, as a young man, um, I uh, from first to sixth grade, I went to summer school and I learned, I became quite uh, proficient in sentence diagramming. I could comprehend what words were, what, where they sat in sentence structure through the sentence diagramming. And it's something that I had always kept in the back of my mind. It was something that was kind of entrained in me as a young man. Um, I learned from a, from a Hispanic lady, out of, actually as she was out of Mexico. Her name was uh, Naomi Cromwell. And she was a teacher at a school that I went to. And uh, she was kind enough to let me go to summer school every summer to continue my studies because I was, 
I was fascinated by, by the English language and, and how it worked. Um, years later, come to find out, I ran into this, my partner, who ended up being my partner, David Eiffelwin Colin Miller. And uh, we got big into the grammar and how the order of operations flow, and then how it flowed in and out of contract in our usury, in, in our day-to-day -day usury of our, of our, of our lives. You created this, this mathematical interface on grammar to show people you can write a sentence frontwards and you can write it backwards and it has the same value. Here's an example. For the bridge is over the water. I'll say it backwards. For the water is under the bridge. Over and under are opposite prepositions, and both sentences are the same picture. Uh, from our driver's licenses, to our insurance, to our properties on title, to um, f things such as they call the birth certificate. One of the predominant beliefs in modern culture is that licenses, permits, registrations, and other forms of documentation are required to operate motor vehicles, use public roads, build structures and establishments, engage in free enterprise, and much more. Sadly, these beliefs are based on little to no investigation whatsoever, and are false. And we, we became cognizant that their location to enforce all this was the, was the courtrooms. This is where they enforce the contracts. And when we started breaking apart the, the function of that courtroom and the courthouse, it took us into many fields, such as postal, such as law of the flag, such as bailments and timelines for those contracts to come in and out of those courthouses. As we broke those down, or as I broke those down, and became cognizant and gave closure to these foreign judges who were in these courthouses, they started playing their games with me, which means they would come off the bench, sit across the table from me, try to function as my master. I'd have to hit them up with timelines to undo what they did. And it, it, they shared a lot of secrets with me within this time frame of three years from 96 actually to, to 99, uh, four years, I apologize. Uh, in those secrets, um, I blew myself up many times. I ended up in jail, not knowing things, uh, because it was, it was, it was merely a, a, a capture the contract and, and learning the bailments of timelines of how they moved me as a piece of cargo in and out of there. And what they stemmed that from was the birth certificate at my docking on this planet called the, in the hospitals, their port of entries. Port being a pronoun of being an adverb, entry being a negative try. En means no, so it's no try, port of no try. And uh, when we study the syntax, which is the mechanics of the order of operations of how words come together, we developed a numerical cipher code to identify what things made things a fact and what things now we use zero as a conjunction, and there's two conjunctions in the, in the English language. And is a command, and the word or is an option. Now the word, uh, the adverb, we gave a one, because the adverb is used more than any other word. And the adverb is a modifier. It modifies the speed of which something is going to be modified at. Now the adverb will modify a verb, which is thinking or motion. So when you have a one in front of a two, it's an adverb creating a verb. Now three is used for an adjective because an adjective represents color, opinion, and modifier, or modification, which means you're gonna change something or try to influence an individual's ability to think by coloring it. If you color something and you change it, you're actually committing perjury because you're injecting your own prejudice or your uh, opinions based on how you're going to describe it. What things made things verb or adjectives or creating subjective interpretation into adjective pronouns or verbs that don't exist in time and space. Um, during my voyage uh, through this learning curve between uh, 96 through 99, um, I met many judges um, 
Some were very mean to me and some were very kind to me in sharing secrets, sharing technology, sharing techniques of what made them a judge, how to become a judge. Um, as I became very um, effective in it, um, I made many enemies in the judicial system and I made many friends. Uh, you know, there's good and bad in everything. They were caught up in usury of their system and I was figuring out how to get out of that usury of that system. In the studies, the U.S. judicial system back in 1996 through 1999 would jump the, under what they call the, the employees of the courtroom, being the judges, the clerks, the, the, the sheriffs, the bailiffs, the, the, the prosecutors, the defendants. They would all jump behind what's called the Foreign Sovereign's Immunity Act. In the Foreign Sovereign's Immunity Act, it was the bankruptcy protection of sovereigns while their where their sovereignty was no longer they were no longer sovereigns where they were bankrupt so what we had to do was uncover what made them bankrupt how did they get to that bankrupt position to be under the under the the safeguard of the foreign sovereigns immunity act and so um, we it, it 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 took us into studying where the United States government came up through three bankruptcies, stemming from when they first borrowed the money on July 1st, 1775. Um, years later, and I, I'll, I'll come back to this, but uh, years later I got to personally look in Benjamin Franklin's uh, postal book in the museum in, uh, Pen at the uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin Post Office in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I got to look into his bank charter and, and see where they borrowed the money and how it worked. But I did not, at the time when I was challenging the U.S. judicial system, I could only take it back to where they could see because they had to have joinder, right? You had to have joinder. And so I would I introduce the uh, 1929 stock market crash and then the 70-year moratorium for international bankruptcies run 70 years, which uh, took us to um, November 2nd, uh, or actually September 17th, 1999 and 45 days took us to the election and then for that one year under the under the 1999 to 2000 presidency um, uh, Mr. Clinton at the time uh, in his book you know he says I'm the last US president well this is what he's talking about in it he's saying he's not telling the people the truth of what what actually happened the federal government had to physically vacate the Constitution which were the rules and guidelines for the bankruptcy and they physically had to leave the District of Columbia for so many days. Thus, the Florida election of uh, the Florida Chads of uh, the year of 2000 on the presidential election, because the president was the trustee, the the the, the administrator, the ex chief administrator of the bankruptcy. That was his function uh, to all presidents uh, during the bankruptcy. Um, one thing that was very interesting that I'd like to bring up is. During this, uh, during this journey of figuring this out, uh, some judges would really work with me and want to learn, and some judges would be very antagonistic and, of course, throw me right in jail. Have to, you know, I figured out about the judicial system and the jails being a, a clearinghouse for custom house brokers, how when you check into their jail system, you engage in usury with them, and they run you on timelines in those vessels. And so I, I figured all that out during this time frame, and I would later use it to my advantage in other cases as, as my journey would, and my quest would go on. Um, um, dealing with the, uh, the Foreign Sovereign's Immunity Act and the bankruptcy, when they came out of the bankruptcy, uh, which means uh, I could target the exact date that they were going to have to leave the bankruptcy. And, I was living with my grandmother at the time, and she had a placemat of all the presidents of the United States on this placemat. And uh, she was, you know, because of the Mockingbird program and the things that I was going through in the local community, uh, running me through the newspapers, um, slandering my name, slandering me, uh, causing me to lose all my friends, um, people not shunning me in the community, not wanting to be around me because I was making a stand on grammar, on, on the flag, and, the, and because it was correct. It's, it's, it's true, and it's correct that when you go into a port to navigate 
and 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 set sale of your contract in that foreign port, you have to give closure on what flag you're coming to the port with. This is true. Nobody in the world can take that away from anyone out there. And you have the right, the sovereign right, to hoist your colors when you come into that port. Whether you know how to do it or not, that's I'm not I'm not disputing that or anybody's techniques. I just know that there are timelines that function within that. With that being said, uh, my grandmother was very concerned about me on a personal level because of the slander and the abuse that I was taking in the newspapers, the shunning she was seeing in the community towards me, and she wanted me to go back to college. And I told her I would go back to college based on one criteria. They would have to announce a president on November 7th, which was the election night for the year 2000. And this was in uh, July of that year, 2000, before the election. And I had filed in a document uh, during the slander and the things that I had been going through in Fremont County, uh, through the Fremont County judicial system. Uh, there was a judge specifically that would, came off the bench for me nine times. His name was Judge Donald Hall. He taught me many secrets. And I was very blessed to have him as, a, as my foe and then as my friend later in life. In uh, Dane County, uh, Wisconsin, um, I was a method server as a postmaster for the delivery of the mail in a lawsuit by a federal, federal hyphen judge colon Janice hyphen K colon Logan. I was not involved in Janice hyphen K colon Logan's cases. I was simply a mail server. Because they did not like the mail, they attempted to prosecute me. This was my, after I had set up the global construct, after I had logged in the flag with the Secretary of the Navy's office, after I've done everything that I had done, um, I was on good terms with, with DC at the time, I thought. Uh, during this trial, I learned how two-faced they could be. Um, the first 30 days, I was uh, picked up. I was coming in to testify in another trial unrelated to the Wisconsin apparatus that was coming against me. But I did one very intelligent thing. I registered my paperwork first under three-day notice with the Secretary of the Navy's office for the martial law, because I was walking into a foreign vessel in dry dock under martial law. I registered the contract with the um, Secretary of the State's office for the state of North Carolina. I registered it with the um, uh, nearest post office to the courthouse and to the U.S. Customs in the territory of the, of the North Carolina. Uh, when I showed up to testify in that specific trial, I was taken in the back room by the U.S. Marshal Service. And I held on to my paperwork. I wouldn't let go of my paperwork. And they told me that, uh, they, had to, that they were going to move me to Wisconsin. For they, were gonna, they had charges against me there. Of course, I looked at the charges. And the charges, I said, well, there's nothing but boxes here. Anything in a box is not on a page. U.S. Marshal Service wouldn't hear it. They took me out into the car, the U.S. Marshals did, and they had the prosecutor, they put him on speaker. Because the, the guy's like, this is, the Marshal's like, you're right, this is boxing. We shouldn't move you. He says, but you got to hear this. And they had the, um, the prosecutor uh, for Dane County, his name was Roy Cordy. They had Roy Cordy on the phone, and Roy Cordy's words were, hurt him. The marshals looked at me, and they had a look of fear. And the guy's like, I don't want to hurt you. I said, okay. He says, you, understand, you comprehend what you're walking into. I said, somebody wants to hurt me. He says, somebody wants to hurt you. He says, I wanted you to hear that. Did not want you to not know what you're walking into. He goes, we know you know about the grammar, he says, but it's out of our hands. We have to move you to the county sheriffs. When I got to the county sheriffs in this specific place, because they were functioning as a facilitator 
to move me to Wisconsin. They engaged in hurting me during that time frame. Um, it was 30 days with no food on that specific role. What that meant was I wouldn't engage in usury with their system, which means they couldn't book me, couldn't get my fingerprints, they couldn't get my picture, and I wouldn't wear their clothes. So they stripped my clothes off of me and sat me in a cell naked for 30 days. At the end of that 30 days, the Wisconsin people showed up to move me to Wisconsin. When I got to Wisconsin, Dane County, Wisconsin, I stood my ground again, would not book, would not participate with their usury system, and it got physical, and they hurt me. Um, they cut my clothes off, and they used food as a weapon. That was their number one tool as a weapon because they knew that if I didn't eat, I was going to die. And if I were to touch the food, they would take me to booking and say, you've engaged in usury, you have to participate with our system. If I didn't touch the food, they would never take me to booking. So they were playing the game. And for 70 days, I sat there without food. At the end of 70 days, for the first time in the history of the state of Wisconsin, a judge, now during this time frame, um, they, they beat me down, they froze me out, it was cold. Well, they would spray the room full of cold water and then turn the air conditioning on and I was naked and they'd throw me in these rooms. They'd beat on the walls, what's your name, what's your crime, what's your name, what's your crime, and then in the middle of the night, as they were chanting this for days, they would, had people pounding on the walls, they'd open up the door and go, what's your name, what's your crime? I refused to speak with them. They couldn't get me to traverse because their flags that they were flying were the flags that they were flying on their lapels were wrong. They were all flying yellow fringe flags, and I had the flag filed at the United Nations and at the Pentagon, and I had a duty to never surrender it. So, yeah, I was a sovereign. I had the flag. I had I had the credentials to be who what, what I was doing. And they were trying to get me to go into their system, and I refused. Um, and I have that right, because I'm a sovereign. I have a flag. They couldn't identify who they were, because they were wearing yellow fringe flags, and I know that yellow fringe flag means nothing. So they were advertising nothing, because they were nothing. So it was very difficult, hard to navigate through that. During the end of that 70th day, for the first time in the history of the state of Wisconsin, the judge left the bench. Uh, what that means is he took off his robe and came off onto my plane and sat across the table, and he cried. And he said, such courage and conviction I've never seen. The guards didn't know what to do. My parents didn't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do. But I knew what to do. I yelled at the guards to get this man a chair. This is a man of, of the honor, because he was honest. Sat across the table from me, we had a conversation, and he wanted to get me some food. He says, you're weak, you're beat down, you gotta be hungry. I cried. I told him I was hungry. And then, he had me move to a location to where I could have food. I agreed to that. And I only agreed to it because I asked him to show up every 10 days to check on me under the continuance of the evidence for maritime commerce under 10-day communication back. He says, yes, I will. He says, you're a judge. He says, yes, I'm a federal judge. He says, I will. And he showed up have conversations with me. Then he 
after I built a little strength up and got up to about, I was at that time, I went from 186 pounds to 102 pounds. When I got my strength back up to about 126 pounds, they wanted to move me because I still was pretty weak. And they were still going to try to book me when they got me there. But I didn't book. I was tough. So here I am, the Postmaster General of the United States, Postal Service, the sovereign to secede Britain, and I've got these underlings with birth certificates with no education, beat me down, acting as a vassal for an apparatus behind them, a deep state, telling them that, I, that I'm crazy and I need, and that I'm the bad guy and to get me to surrender the flag so that they could have a position saying that there's no one there to stop them. Because I control the flag, already legged in with the United Nations, already legged in with the Pentagon, already legged in with the post office. I've got a constitution, I've got fee for freight, and I am it. And I've got this apparatus in Wisconsin hiding behind the deep state, attacking me, getting, trying to get me to surrender, thinking that they're doing a good job and all real cool guys. And I'm the man. It's like, hmm, okay. And I couldn't be angry with you. You have to comprehend. These are big guys. They're beating the hell out of me. I can't be angry with them because I know what limited IQ they got, even though they're big, tough guys. Don't get me wrong. You know, there's some guys there that are like, I mean, you don't want to mess around with those guys. They're like 6'10", 320. These are big dudes, 340. These are big guys. It hurts when they squeeze on you. It hurts when they punch you, right? It's the, it hurts. But I can't get mad at them because they've got the IQ of a two-year-old, two right? I'm not mad. I'm, I feel sorry for them. But I could not get angry, and I never got angry with them for beating me down, right? Because it's my country. They're my fellow countrymen. I under comprehend where they're at, but I know also where I'm at. And I also know that I'm playing to the death. I'm not giving up my flag. So one of the things that they did in Wisconsin that I didn't really like was, remember the story I told you about my grandma with the placemats, 90-year-old? At the time now, she's 93, and they chained me up in a room full of attorneys, and they put my grandmother on the phone, begging me to eat the food, begging me to join. I looked at those attorneys. They were laughing. They, were, they, they thought it was the greatest. I'm thinking... Got your faces right here. But what happened in Wisconsin is bygones let be bygones. The Secretary of the Navy's office sent their medical team in to see me and talk to me about standing on the flag. They had a lot of honor for me. They were very cool. And they concurred with what I had done with registering the flag at the Navy's office when the United States ceased to exist. They concurred on the mechanics of my position as a muster hyphen master with the Secretary of the Navy's office. And that they were saying that in their paperwork they were going to say I was a man of my word. To me it meant a lot. Because I was all alone. But that meant a lot to me. They cut my hair. I looked real, real wild. Imagine going 100 days without food. And having a big beard and your hair and you stink. They come in and they cut me up, cut my hair, cut my, gave me a razor, cut my, they, they did it for me. I was pretty weak. And then that judge allowed me to start shipping as postmaster general to start shipping my own food into that vessel because that vessel was parked on my land. I proved to him during those time frames that this is my land. Vessels are all here. They're all got fraud grammar on them. He says, you're going to ship your, your food into that vessel. And so we put together, I didn't, but the people that were outside of the, and witnessing this, put boxes and boxes of food together for me. 
I put manifests together and I mailed my food into that jail holdings facility. I was still in booking because they couldn't book me through booking. But I got my own cell and I had boxes and boxes of food in there. So I got to eat. You know, I couldn't really build my strength up because I was really, my body took a tremendous, a tremendous uh, beat down. They were beating me up too. But the beating stopped as they saw the, the courage of my conviction and the guards were arguing amongst themselves, saying, this is wrong. We don't have a co I could hear them. They were arguing in the hall saying, nobody has a contract with this guy. Why is he here? This is wrong. I could hear the guards arguing. Got to beat him up. Got to beat him up. Roy Cordy says beat him up. And they beat me down, but they didn't knock me out. That's the difference. I picked myself off the ground. I was proud of myself to get that food mailed in there. That was quite an accomplishment. Anyway, I got navigated out of that trial. And I was, a, during that trial, I had turned to the federal government for help. The federal government gave me clues, but they would not step in to help. By clues, they would say, I would call the federal clerk up across the way. I was in a state venue. I'd call the federal clerk up. I'd tell him I'm federal hyphen judge, colon Russell hyphen J, colon Gould. She'd say, I know who you are. You're the guy that's mailed himself into this situation. I says, I didn't mail myself in here by my choice. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. She said, Russell, she says, you just got to aim for navy blue. Aim for navy blue, sir thought a lot about that. You have a lot of time to think when you're by yourself. Lots of thoughts come into your mind, but mainly the food. <laughs> mainly the food. You, you, I literally wrote manifests out of food, what I wanted when I was starving, because they gave me a pen and paper, pencil and paper. And the guards would steal that paper from me. They said, what is he writing about? writing about food. He's hungry. I remember hearing Klein and those guys, Wagner and them guys. You know, I ended up with friends out of there. But I ended up with a lot of enemies too because they didn't like me standing my ground. They thought I was some kind of anarchist. When the mirror was just they had, they were the ones that were fraudulently there. Not me. They brought me there. They shouldn't have. But they did. During that case, when I got out, because I had to challenge the federal government, I figured out a back door to order the U.S. Supreme Court open through the Department of Defense. They helped me. I went to the Pentagon when I got out immediately. My family disowned me. They would not support me in any way. I took a Greyhound bus with the little money I had. I made it back to North Carolina. And there, I got myself mailed up into Washington, D.C. I then needed to use my IRS judgment to bond myself to go into the District of Columbia into the foreign vessel in dry dock through the United States International Trade Commission, for I was foreign to it and it was foreign to me. I registered my bonds, my authorization through the Tr International Trade Commission. They sat down and met with me. They autographed the stamps. I autographed the stamps, and I mailed myself through a back door that I had found in the codes of the U.S. Supreme Court where I did not need a writ of certiorari because I could read the syntax. I could cipher the secret codes. When I ciphered the secret codes, I found a back door to order the court open. At the courthouse itself, they physically took a gold filing from me for I'm the postmaster general of the country. I can file in gold. And I filed a gold coin. They took the gold coin. I ordered the court open on a specific date. I also filed a sea treaty with the nearest church, Catholic church, because the Catholic church was, runs the District of Columbia through the, what they called the, the, the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception which are all the hieroglyphics that you see in all the buildings there. And they run it as a tomb for dead people. 
and they try to claim your, your, your contracts and they try to claim other things that are within you when you pass on. This is wrong. Anyway, through the Basilica National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and through the things that I had done at the Vatican, because I had been to the Vatican, which I haven't got into yet, before I filed my sea treaties, which gave me all the authorization in the world to be there. When the Catholic Cardinal saw me in the church, kitty corner to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I identified myself as the key master of the Vatican, and I had people with me, he said, leave now or I'll have you arrested, and he took off a run from me out of his church. I says, well, how the heck are you going to do that? You're on the run. This is when I needed my security, tactical security teams to grab that guy so I could sit him down to the actualities of the pecking order on this planet. Who I am in correlation to who he's not. So, did not have my security team at that, at that function. Next time. Next time. I am the sovereign of this land taking the position of Great Britain when the United States ceased to exist in 1999. I'm the only person with the bill of the lading on that. Everyone else is ex post facto after the fact. I have the flag. I have the fee for freight. I have the post office and I have the constitution. I have the claim of the life. And I'm registered with the United Nations and with the IMF, the World Bank and all the functions around the world to be who I am. And I am who I am, for I am. And, and the private corporation in Dane County, Wisconsin, was trying to capture me. And I would not succumb to their fraudulent ways. Yeah, they were trying to rec make me, a sovereign, recognize their authority. And they did not have authorization because they did not have the capacity for the statement of a claim. For they were all bound under the birth certificates, which were disqualified in 1999. Just look at the similarities of warehouse receipts and birth certificates. Both document the date of issue, a serial number, registration number or receipt number, a description of the product, and an authorized informant to notify the appropriate government agency. And this was 2003, and they were too naive and arrogant to even know it. So their ignorance was everywhere and their pompousness and their cockiness and their ability to just simply beat people up, they thought that was cool. So, uh, there was a judge specifically that would, came off the bench for me nine times. His name was Judge Donald Hall. He taught me many secrets. And I was very blessed to have him as, a, as my foe and then as my friend later in life um, because we comprehended truth and correctness. And at the end of the day, he did want truth and correctness, though his, his position does not allow him to come to be correct because he is an alien that has invaded our courthouses through the, the yellow fringe flags. Yellow French flags have no authorizations in our courthouses. Not in this, not anywhere on the planet except for in military parades and for the military. And that is correct for the military, but it's not correct for we the people of this planet. And uh, I stood my ground on that. Well, needless to say, my grandma was concerned because she loves me and I loved her. And I promised her that I would go to, back to school to become an orthodontist if they announce a president on November 2nd. But if they did not, then I could be me. And what that means is on July 12th of 2000, I had just come out of a very difficult legal battle where they slandered me tremendously with the, um, the, the legal system in Fremont County. But during the time frame of learning I learned that the clerk of court was the judge. What that means is the clerk has stamps. The stamps leave marks on the vessel paperwork. The judge has the gavel and it only makes a clang. Leaves no mark. 
So the clerk, in fact, was the postmaster, bank banker, doing the administrative mechanics in that foreign vessel in dry dock, not the judge. Judge is only an actor with a yellow fringe flag that means nothing, with a robe that means he's mourning justice. So the clerk of courts, in fact, is the judge. Once I learned it was a postal mechanic, I went down to my local post office and worked with a postmaster for the United States Postal Service named John Gray. Now, John Gray was very by the book for the United States Post Office, but he was also a Mason. And under his 33 degree Masonry status, he wanted to learn about what I was doing with the, with the grammar so he could learn how to safeguard his things later on in life. And I worked with him for three years. He taught me, took me into his office, and took me around the post office in Lander, Lander, uh, Lander, Wyoming, the U.S. Postal Service there, office there. And I got to learn and become very good friends with those, those employees at that time. Uh, they, they were on my side because I was a postmaster and they were making fun of me in the newspapers about being a postmaster and the mechanics of that. And the, the post office was on my side. When I came out of jail the last time in Fremont County, the, uh, which I was placed in illegally, of course, uh, the, um, John Gray left his position as the postmaster of the post office. And I went to his post office to talk to him on why he didn't help me because I had given him commands to help me. I'd been to the FBI. The FBI wouldn't help either. I sat down with the FBI English professors during this specific circumstance because I, a judge came off the bench and sat, sat across the table from me, and then he, he left across the table from me and went and sat back up in his foreign jurisdiction. He broke the law because you can't leave jurisdiction once you create joinder. Once you create joinder, you're in contract with that person. You must honor the contract. This judge was functioning dishonorably. So he'd sit across the table from me, take off his robe, and then he'd go back up onto his foreign plane and leave planet Earth, changing planes. I apologize, breaking the continuance of the evidence. And I returned him into the FBI. The FBI sat down with me three times in Lander, Wyoming at the field office. And they brought in their English professors because I was explaining about the quantum grammar. They identified it to be correct. When they identified it to be correct, I then looked at their credentials, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Of is an adverb, federal is an adjective, bureau is a pronoun, of is an adverb making investigation a verb. But the prefix in to a word means no. So I asked them, are you doing a no investigation. They all laughed, and, they, and when they laughed, they says, "Well, then, to me, the Federal Bureau of Investigation stands for fumbling, bumbling idiots." And they all laughed. They says, "Very good. This is correct." He's, and the professors looked at me and they said, "This guy's correct. We are fumbling, bumbling idiots here." And then, you know, we left on good terms because, but I knew they weren't going to help. So I went back to the courthouse, and of course I was arrested on site for, for, you know, for nothing because they couldn't establish joinder of jurisdiction because they were breaking the law on me, and I had no one to police it. So I'd go to the post office and give them commands. They wouldn't police it either. But Mr. Gray had a heart, and in his heart, when I was in jail, my father had went to the post office and asked for the help. Why aren't you honoring Russell's contracts? And Mr. Gray said this to my father. He says, we've made the gravest of mistakes here. My dad says, what do you mean? He says, they're running an honest man through the newspaper. Tell Russell when he gets out to come on by. My dad come down to the jail, and they let him come in to talk to me. He says, he's, I'm like, he's not going to help. I was a little disturbed. He's not going to help me? This was in uh, 98, 99, or 99. They said, no, he's not going to help, my dad said. I said, well, no one's here to help me. I guess I'm going to have to figure this out for myself. He goes, you should just traverse, blah, blah, blah. I says, no, I can't do that. I says, I'm correct. I can't stop being correct. And uh, I got out, uh, one, uh, got out of that case, 
and I went back to, the, to see Mr. Gray and confront him on why he did not help me. And when I got there, Maria, the, the clerk, the postal clerk says, you're out. I was like, yeah. They says, John left something for you. I go, what do you mean John left something for me? And he says, John is retired, officially. But he left this package for you. What? I opened up the package, and there was the job form for the application of a postal no specter or inspector for the Postmaster General of the United States Postal Service. And so immediately I syntax that, I mailed it into the US Post Office, the headquarters in Washington, DC, and on the green card label, instead of I had handwritten US Postmaster General Russell Heif and J. Colin Gould, they placed a label over what I had mailed them. Labels are classified as tickets. Tickets are classified as postage stamps. And when I autographed it, it made me Postmaster General of the United States Postal Service at 475 Lafayette Plaza, Southwest Lafayette Plaza in Washington, D.C. I just became Postmaster General of the United States Postal Service by mechanics. And I knew that they were going to have to leave the federal government. I'm like, because I saw the bankruptcy come, I was like, well, this still doesn't change anything on this bankruptcy problem we got going on here. People are used as collateral with other nations because the U.S. is bankrupt. Because the end, of, the end of the 70 year moratorium was coming up. And I told my grandma, I said, I'm back to my grandma, I apologize, I'm kind of skipping around here a little. But my grandma's like, you got to go to school, you got to go get your education. I said, yeah, I will. But if they announce that there's no president on this specific night, then I'm this person on the post. I'm the only guy under contract in the, in the, in the District of the Columbia. I'm the only guy with a contract because the system was ending. Now, one of the unique functions of my studies with Mr. Gray is he took me into Title 39 which is the mechanics for the post office. And I got to learn under Title 39, Section 101, the first subsection of the postal mechanics for the United States Postal Service was the post office always had to have a constitution and they always had to have a president. But on that specific day of November 2nd, 7th, 2000, they physically had to vacate, which means they physically had to leave the presidency, they had to leave the Constitution, and that's what the Florida Chads was about. All the people were bought into the Florida Chads, but they physically had to vacate the, the federal government, uh, the, the trustee of the federal government. And, but Maya was the only guy with the contract in play at that time. Uh, during that time frame, before that, uh, my partner at the time, David Eiffel, Winkle, and Miller, and myself, uh, filed for the the mechanics of grammar for the Title IV 1 to 1.9 dimension flags, sections 1, 2, and 3. We quantized that on August 12, 1999, and we filed that before they came out of bankruptcy at the United Nations. And we were given our sovereignty status at the United Nations for the flag because the United States government was coming out of the bankruptcy on uh, September 12th of that year, 1999. In the studies of the slavery of mankind, there is a charter corporation that countries take to their corporate entities for the identification of parcel, land, um, their ability to communicate, which means the alphabet, the numerical systems that they're using to create sums and differences, not only for communication, but for the mathematical se sequences to find the adding, the subtracting, the, the, all the mathematical functions of that country go on publication at the International Bureaus of Weights and Measures, which is an adjective, pronoun, adverb, verb scenario. There's no such thing as a verb weight. There's no such thing as a verb measures because of is an adverb, but because, because it lacks the article to command the authority of the fact. So now of is the adverb making weights and verb, uh, weights and measures a verb. No such thing. It's all fictitious conveyance of grammar. At a later date and later time, I would sue for those charters and have my own global hyphen bureau of the weights and measures. But at that specific time in Washington, D.C. of 1999, 
the, 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 the technology, I had not found it out yet till a later date. But their bills of the ladings were null and void, which means they, that, that meant that their birth certificate system for creating our fellow mankind as a slave was gone. The Barron's Dictionary of Banking Terms defines a certificate as a paper establishing an ownership claim. So right there, we notice that everyone with a birth certificate is defined as being owned. But the problem was, is the fellow mankind had no identification paperwork because they were not trained in the bankruptcy. And so they carried on with their birth certificates and maintained the slavery of the status quo, what they, what they would normally do. They were not trained and educated. It wasn't until we created the claims of the life to create a substantial fact that we are no longer docking on this planet through a birth certificate, which gave us our tangible facts to control our weights and measures and, and how we convey contract. So that, this, it's a very important thing to be cognizant of at the end of the bankruptcy. This, this is what happened. So when they announced the night of November 7th, uh, 2000, when they announced that they had a problem with the Florida Chads, uh-oh, we can't announce it's a president. We got to vacate. Are y'all buying this? Bankruptcy's ended, but we're not going to tell you. And they moved to the, the, the function into a foreign vessel in dry dock called the U.S. Supreme Court. As a foreign vessel in dry dock, they just vacated the will of the people. But they didn't have to follow the will of the people anymore because the charter was gone. It was an attempt to take over this country. I was the only citizen in this country with a legal and lawful bill of the lading for the identification of a flag, for the identification of a constitution, and for the identification of myself to give closure that I was here for open for business. They vacated and then attempted to kick a ruse off. And that's what uh, the, the 2000 election was actually about. Yeah, and they, yeah, it was it was it was a it was an attempt to catch all the people and create a new slave market, and I didn't want that to happen, so I did something about it. The night it happened, and then the night they announced it, I had a big dinner with my grandma. My grandma was so excited; she believed that I was going to go back to school, go get become an orthodontist. She was convinced of it. And then when they announced it, at the time she was 90 years old, when they announced it, her jaw dropped. She looked down at her placemats. She looked at me, and she told me I was smarter than anybody she's ever met. She said, you're, you're smarter than everyone I've ever met. No one can predict that like you. She goes, I believe everything you're saying. There's nothing more that I can do in my life because you are my off, you're, you're my lineage here. You know more about what's going on than me. I'm 90 years old. I've been here a long time. Choose the right partners. Blah. You know, she gets. She told me, you know, I, at the time I, I I I listened, but I was so excited I couldn't hear. I didn't get it till years later. But I was so excited because I was caught up in the matters of what I was doing. I couldn't hear the wisdom in what my grandma had said. And I think a lot about that now. I think a lot about that. So, um, so it happened. And um, I didn't know how they were going to react to me when I went back to D.C. My first attempt to go back to D.C. after the bankruptcy was on January 15th, 2002. I went with my time. He was at the time my corporate partner, David Hyphen Wing Colin Miller. And he had some paperwork that he had to turn in. And I had some paperwork of my own that I had created because uh, when the bankruptcy ended, uh, the IRS was kicked out of the United States. I knew the secrets, and so I, I figured out 
as a federal uh, figured out how to become during my my uh, my battles with Mr. Hall. He taught me how to be a judge inadvertently because those were the trails and the doors that I was and the secrets that I was opening. And I learned how to order the courts open and, and, and hold trial, put things on calendar. And uh, I took on the IRS as my first as my first um, uh, manifest enclosure to who I was as a postal hyphen in hyphen inspector because I'd quantumized and and um, I, I got I'm the only citizen of this country that has a, a signed document with the clerk of court as a judge for the vacation of, of uh, the duty for the performance of the taxes. And it's uh, in Casper, Wyoming and then I took that judgment and I filed it all around the world and uh, set up uh, during the t right after I'd done that I set up uh, a re realized that the head clearinghouse for all courthouses in the United States and worldwide was the Universal Postal Union in Bern, Switzerland. And uh, I started a quantum postal union in Bern, Switzerland off of that judgment, taking that judgment and banking it over into a, a trust for our own postal union. Um, there were three of us on as original shareholders. In the original shareholding contract, we filed under generation virilities Generation virilities meant that our offspring would function with facts as facts. You know, we wouldn't have birth certificates, social security numbers. You know, we would function in a in a quantum grammar format. Uh, David's uh, family did not, and, and the other gentleman's family did to a point, and then they vacated at a later date. And so I was the only one left with the sh with the one hundred percent stakeholder shareholder of the postal union that I had created because David's family. Uh, chose to walk a different life, right? And for whatever reason, I'm, and and the other gentleman vacated it as well at a later date, which we'll get into a little later in this uh, in this summary here. Uh, before I get into the first time back to Washington D.C., the first thing that I did when I filed the Postmaster General is I mailed myself into Canada without a passport with just my claim of the life, my shipping manifest, and I went, I gave three day notice to Canada Customs up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. When I got off the plane, they gave me their customs declaration form. I syntax their forms to be 100% fraud. Put the syntax key code on there, me and this other gentleman. We walked up to the front desk and said, we found fraud on your paperwork. So you're using Canada as, as a verb here. So there's no such thing. There's no such lo location anywhere in the dic in any dictionary for the Canada to function as a verb. This is very good. It does not. And they took a look at my paperwork. They put their Canada Customs stamp on my stamps and my quantum contract, and we got shipped into Canada. On the way out of Canada, when we got to the United States, again we syntax the Customs declaration forms. Told them it was 100% fraud. As soon as we walked up there, they says they said Postmaster Gould. I said Postmaster General Russell Hyphen J Coleman Gould. They took the, my syntax forms, of red ink of their forms. They ripped them up and they threw them in the trash. And they said, "For you, it's like the Bruce, Sting, Bruce Springsteen song, Born in the U.S. of A." I said, "Very good, very good." And I, they let me. They all stood down, and I walked right into this country. Or into my land, back into my land mass, my land mass, so I could walk wherever I wanted to go. So that was very unique. Uh, the first time I went back to Washington D.C., like I was saying, was January fifteenth. That was July of uh, two thousand one. That was July of two thousand one. I did the customs thing in Canada. So.